afternoon. Good afternoon. By now, uh, I guess the majority of you have uh, experienced flights, uh, flown off to many distant lands. Normally, it's the defining point for holidays, vacations, and also the, the signature that the, the holiday is actually coming to an end. Um, it's growing. It's growing at an alarming rate, and what we hope to do is share with you over the next quarter of an hour what we're doing to make sure that not only can we continue to enjoy this great, great opportunity that's air travel, but also make sure it's affordable for everyone and not just the privileged few. And in doing that, actually being cognizant that there's a great responsibility, and that comes from emissions and the whole environmental infrastructure that we have to protect. It is a global, global activity. It's the cornerstone of, of global commerce, really. Um, jobs around the world, 56 million, uh, support not only those that build the aircraft and the product, those that fly them and the infrastructure around them. As you can see, it's, it's, it's global gross domestic product, 3.5% of the world, is, is just phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And it's a huge part of that that's keyed into Bristol here. If we were a country, <coughs> we'd be ranked number 19 in the world. It says Poland up there, but it's also about the same size as Switzerland. So it gives you an idea of the size. And when we go through the figures, you'll see how that's going to grow and just get bigger and bigger. And tourism, 35%, 35% of us jump on a plane and hopefully have an enjoyable experience. But again, a lot of the work is that enjoyment is starting to come under pressure. It's coming under pressure from a variety of ways, how to get to the airports. Do you enjoy the airports? I'd just be interested. Anyone enjoy an airport? Thank you. Right answer. Um, it is something that's, that's going to grow. In the last 10 years, we've seen a 45% growth in air travel. 45%. And you wonder why the airports are getting so congested. With that growth, the amount of fuel we're consuming has also increased. But not as much as you'd think. It's only increased by 3%. So we're doing something right. But again, if we don't keep an eye on the future, what's going to happen is that that small contribution to man-made CO2 is just going to grow, and we have to make aerospace and the aviation industry and travel sustainable. In the next 20 years, what's going to happen? Air traffic will double. You, know, you look at the debates on third runway at Heathrow, it's a purely a capacity issue globally. It's not just Heathrow, it's everywhere. There will de be demand for 28,000 new aircraft. 28,000. The market value is going to be about $4 trillion. Now, with that expenditure and that investment, surely we should be doing something that actually takes the views of the environment and has those right at the top, and we do. 2050 targets. We've got to look at significantly changing not only the aircraft, but the way we operate, the way we, we enjoy air travel. We've got to reduce carbon dioxide by 75%, nitrous oxides by 90%, and reduce noise by 65%. The last thing we want is to have an out of control industry that we all enjoy because it gets us to a destination, but has a massive impact on the environment. The part we have to reflect on for Bristol is that every Airbus aircraft flies on Bristol designed wings, and we're very proud, very proud indeed. It gives us a massive uh, jobs infrastructure around the country. There's over 10,000 employed directly, you know, and that extends to over 100,000 in the whole network that supports the industry associated with Airbus. 
So there's a lot of people internally as well as externally who are looking for us to do it right. There's three themes that, that we've started. The first theme is what's the future plane going to look like? For me, I'm a geek. I was asked in the questionnaire before I started, uh, came along here, what, what were my particular things? And I said, I'm a geek, I'm an aerospace geek. What's the plane going to look like? What's the cabin going to look like? What are we doing about not only the plane, but how we operate? That actually makes it more, more comfortable, actually delivers the products and services that you want and I want when I go on holiday. And to underpin that, what are we doing about the intellectual capital of the country and the world? We have to nurture the best engineering minds. The solutions to all these problems aren't in the businesses today. They're in universities doing their first degree. They're at schools. And you only have to look at the discussion that's going on in the, the various media and the news events about starting to realize how valuable engineering and science is to the, to the economy. So we'll take a view of these each independently. And looking at the plane, uh, I'll talk through this, we'll come back to it. And this is just a run through of what you might see. Different sections, so far looking pretty the same, but can you start considering what's going to happen? If you've only got half the number of people on the plane, why can't you just squeeze the back rows up and leave more leg room? Why can't you harvest energy out of the seats, out of the bodies, to help, well, cool you and add power to the aircraft? More interactive. We want, it's 4G now, it'll be 10G in, in sooner or later. But we have to do something and do it differently. <coughs> when we did a survey of 10,000 people who, who travel regularly around the world, we said, okay, what do you want? Everyone said they wanted to fly more, but there's a few conditions on that. They want, to be, they want it to be sustainable. They don't want to do the damage to the planet, but at the same time, they don't want to be cramped, herded like cattle, and just ushered through and felt like they're on a conveyor belt. 37% think air travel is getting more stressful. And, and I, for one, normally late for a flight, can, can probably push that round a couple of notches myself. 51% uh, thinks the, the airline operators should offer more, more service, you know, more flights. And 32% think delays are terrible. And again, those delays are on the ground, but also they're up in the air, where the skies are getting congested with the systems we have today. So we've got to look beyond just the product. We've got to look at what we do with the product and how we operate this global infrastructure. We've got the money. We've seen, you've seen the, the, the hard figures. But if we continue the way we are, it's five million hours excess flight time just because you can't fly point to point and land immediately. That's nine million tons of excess fuel in a year, 28 million tons of carbon dioxide. It's something that has to change. And we, along with our other partners in the industry, are looking to change that. We're looking at the universities, we're looking at lobbying groups, and for ideas, it's not just the hardcore engineers, geeks. It's everyone that's got a good idea. No one has got exclusivity on a good idea that's going to save the planet. So where do we go? Where do we go to start attacking this? There are a couple of areas that, that, that stand out. We've got to look at ground operations, in the air, the fuel, all of this has to come together as a cohesive plan. Today, we have bits of it. For the future, we have to start pulling all of this together because we want everyone to be able to enjoy air travel and really, truly enjoy, but at the same time, have a clear conscience. Smarter skies, five elements. Best operation for, for an aircraft is to get it up to cruise as fast as possible. Once you're in cruise, what's the most efficient way of going point to point? When you land, you don't want any noise. You want to be quiet. You want to whisper. 
when it's on the ground? What happens on the ground? How can we improve that? How can we actually take away the need for additional runways? Is there something, surely there's something we can do? And then the overall infrastructure. You know, we, we, in the Western world, we're, we're almost bound by huge areas of conurbation that makes this job very difficult. <coughs> we don't have the luxury of wide open spaces. So again, it comes back to this responsibility, this responsibility that is across the globe. It's not just the UK looking at this, it's every single country that's involved in aerospace and air travel. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll start off and look at the, the, how do we, the, the question of how do we get an aircraft into the sky quicker. This is a, 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 one of the thoughts is that we actually don't need the engine so much. We use a skid and a launch system. Got to say, the first time I saw that, I thought my gin and tonic was going to go all over me. It is quite scary because the, uh, the, the, when I asked the person who came up with the idea, he said, of course, you can go vertically up. Now, any nervous passengers amongst you will probably want to go by ship. <laughs> Once you're in the air, why can't we learn from the birds? We can also learn from the Great Britain Team Pursuit Cycling Team. An aircraft takes the lead, the ones behind consume 15% less fuel. But the systems today don't allow us to do that. They're archaic. We're running archaic systems with a high technology product. So you can imagine taking flight point to point, the plane works out where you are and joins into the flying pattern. Coming into land, low noise, free, free glide approach, we can reduce noise by 75%. I'm going to say if we switch the engines off. Now, that's a glide. It's not a plummet. So when it comes into land, it does stop. On the, once it's on the ground, an aircraft in its life drives probably about 300,000 kilometers. That's more than you or I probably drive. But it does it, and it's not just one. We've got 28,000 of these things. They're going to be doing exactly the same thing if we don't do something about it. And then we've got to look at the powering of the infrastructure. What fuels are we going to be running on? We're looking at alternative fuels. We're looking at biofuels, green algae, algae that takes from the air the CO2, converts it into, into, a, into a fuel that we can then burn. So it's CO2 neutral. It's got to be one of the ways forward. Great statistic, and I love statistics. I'm just coming across as a geek, I know, but never mind. If we planted the whole area of France in, in uh, sunflowers, we could generate enough fuel to power the, the French national airline fleet domestically. If we planted a, a fuel crop called Tropa in the area of Belgium, we could generate enough fuel for the world. Now, that's a pretty good use of Belgium. I think they'd be a bit miffed. <laughs> so just running through these things, because it's only when these things come together as a whole that the sum is worth far more than the individual pieces. The rocket sled, sorry, I shouldn't say rocket sled. The assisted takeoff. <laughs> it's not a, a catapult that you see on an aircraft carrier. The formation flying really taking advantage of things that nature does as a matter of course. We have the systems, we have the technology to do both of these two things. As scary as the first one is, and probably as scary as this one is, is when you wind down the blind halfway through the night and you see there's an aircraft sat on your, your left-hand side. The fuel. Issue about the fuel is we need to get the fuel in the right places and it's, it's investment. Glided approach, the space shuttle's been doing it for years. Sadly, no more, but it's been doing it for years and hitting a postage stamp effectively from space. How do you stop if you've got the engines off? Well, if you look to Formula One, they've got Kerr's technology, regenerating energy, use it for braking. When it's on the ground, automatic guided vehicles 
to connect up to the aircraft. You don't use the engine. You reduce and almost eliminate ground-based CO2. So then we come on to just a real quick canter through the aircraft again. And as you walk through, and this is a bit of a run, I do apologize, um, must be an easy jet. As you come through, you'll see a number of features. Dispense with the bags, get them out of the way, you don't need them in the cabin, just take what you need. Actually use the space intelligently. Fast reconfiguration for whatever you need the aircraft to do. Connectivity. Now, I need two volunteers in the audience. Um, actually, the gentleman there. Could you stand up, please, sir? And the lady here. Could you stand up, please? Okay. There's about there's a hundred of us in the room. Hundred of us in the room. These two kind individuals, uh, volunteers, we call them, have said uh, that they would represent the CO2 emissions that come from civil aerospace. It's only 2% of man-made CO2 comes from what I've just run through. So these two are doing an awful lot for the planet. Shame on the rest of you. Look what you're doing. <laughs> the downside is we think it's a good idea to tax these two for the privilege of flying. Thank you very much.